integration of the infinitesimal strain tensor. Look, we won't go beyond the infinitesimal strain tensor. Let me tell you that this is also possible to do that, to obtain some compatibility equations and to integrate them for the general theory, for a finite strain theory. But, I mean, it doesn't add any concept. And most of the time, we just knowing that for the, for the infinitesimal strain case is enough for education of our minds in continuum mechanics. So then, in order to integrate, once we know that the, a certain strain field it's, uh, uh, is uh, integrable, fulfills the, the compatibility conditions, now we want to integrate and obtain the displacement fields. But in order to do make it systematic, rather than easier, systematic, we look for a systematic way so that we cannot make mistakes when we do it. Okay? And so we need to manipulate the available equations that we have so far and obtain some additional equations. Look, for instance, maybe you remember, or you should remember now, the rotation tensor. The rotation tensor in infinitesimal strain was defined as the skew, the skew of the gradient of U, which by definition is one half of the gradient of U, which can be expressed in compact notation like that, minus its transpose, which is nabla U. U nabla minus nabla U. So finally, this is component of U nabla IJ is derivative of UI with respect to a J. Component IJ of nabla U is derivative of UJ with respect to XI. So this is that component omega IJ of the rotation tensor. This is a skew symmetric tensor, so it looks like that. It has zero in the diagonals, and then it has sim a skew symmetric, one disymmetric mirroring with respect to the main diagonal of ten terms that are mirroring but changing the sign. Okay? By the way, these terms are used to define a vector. Okay? That vector is called the rotation vector which can be always ob obtained from uh, a skew symmetric uh, tensor. A vector is also can also be defined in terms of the skew symmetric uh, uh, tensor that fulfills that taking that, that component as first component, this component as second component, and this component as third component. The other ones are the same uh, changing the sign. Okay? So theta 1 is minus omega 2, 3, or minus omega y, z. Theta 2 is minus omega z, x. Theta 3 is minus omega x, z, y. Look that I take the components here, and the index which is not here appears here. The component here and the index which is not here appears here. 1, 2, what's, what, what's next? 3. And the order are the clockwise order. Okay? So look. Given theta, that's important, given theta, I can always reconstruct omega from that, from this definition. Okay? And theta, by the way, is, happens to be one half of the rotation of U. That's something that we got before. So that's the first recall of previous equations. And now we can operate a little bit with that. By definition of omega, then I do some algebraic operations. What I do is that I differentiate any of these components with respect to all the components, xk, and then I manipulate a little bit, I add this term in plus and minus, I rearrange terms, and then I find that this, this uh, rotation tensor fulfills this equation. Derivative of omega ij with respect to xk is derivative of ik with respect to j minus derivative of jk with respect to xi. Okay. Why is that? Look, now, now I can apply these equations, these equations, to the, those ij that are related to, that are related to uh, thetas, okay? Look, for i equal 2, j equal 3, I obtain theta 1. If I derive O differentiate omega 2, 3 with respect to x1, I would obtain derivative of theta 1 with respect to x1, and so on. So look, these equations, in fact, these equations here, these equations can be specified 
by those components i j that define the rotation vector, and we can obtain this nice system of differential equations. How do they look like? Look, like? look, here there appear the three first derivative of theta one, the first component of the rotation vector. In terms of what? At the right hand side, there appear things that I know because I'm supposing that I know the strains. So I know the derivative of the strains. So that part here is known. And that part here provide the three derivatives, separated derivatives of theta one with respect to x, y, x, y, and x, y, and z. This, looking now at the first stage of the solution of the problem, we are intending, this allows us very simply to integrate that system. So if I know a function, I know the first derivative, a function of x, y, z, scalar function, and I know the three derivative of this function with respect to x, y, z, integration is trivial. We'll see that in examples, okay? Okay, so these equations can be easily used to, in a first stage, obtain by integration of these equations, theta one, theta one. Then these equations, which provide the three th th derivative of theta two, the second component of the rotation vector, with respect to x, y, z, in terms of derivative of something that I know in advance because I've just taken as a data the different uh, strains. And the same for omega three, for theta three. As I told you, we found that system of equation that is the one that we use in a preliminary step to obtain, to, in to integrate the three components of the vector of rotation. Second step is, more, is much easier. Second step consists of looking that, by definition, the gradient of the displacement, so the rate of displacement with respect x, y, and z, is epsilon plus omega. Epsilon I know. And omega can be computed from the results that I obtain in here. And in fact, that gives an equation that says that j i j equal epsilon ij plus omega ij. If we translate that for every component, we obtain these equations here. For i equal j one, j equal one, j equal two, j equal three, etc. Look, what we have in the left-hand side of these equations? In the left-hand side, we see the three derivatives of ux. ux with respect to x, y, and z. And at the right-hand side, we have something that we know because the data or the components of the rotations that we have computed before. So we know already now the right hand side. And this is again a system of three first separated first order equations for every component, which is easy to integrate. From that, we can integrate to x, we can integrate to y, and we can integrate to z. So in summary, the method consists of two steps. First, integration, obtain, obtention of the uh, rotation vector from a set of equations, this is, which is that one here. And second, once we know these three vectors, then integration of the second set, which is that, where we have the three derivative of every component in terms of the strains, components, and the results of this. So finally, it's not that difficult, okay? Just two steps for separating everything and solve three easy systems, first order differential equations. And in the first, in the, in the, st in the rotations, then in the uh, displacements, okay? Look, there is something that, that is, is important. Whenever we integrate a first order system of equations, we obtain constants, you know, because the general solution is a specific solution plus constants. So in the first integration, when we, in, in, when we integrate that system of equations, that system of equation, then we have to name some theta one, some theta two, some theta three, as a functions of x, y, z, plus some constants, because constants are not affected or come to zero from this first derivative of theta one, theta two, theta three. 
what we are obtaining is that system, certain solution, plus a constant. Constant, that means not depending on x, y, z, only depending on t eventually. Okay? So the derivative of theta, theta, with respect to x, y, z, just cancels this constant. But this constant is part of the solution. And has to be given methods uh, or data, what are called boundary conditions, to determine this constant have to be given in the statement of the problem. That's what we see now. Okay? We need at least three conditions that, says, that say what is the uh, value of theta at a certain point at any value at any time of t. If we know that, then by replacing here the point and knowing the result for any t, we can resolve this constant or this constant in terms of a space function with respect to t. Okay? Look, this constant then will appear when we integrate the second system of equations. So this constant somehow will be included here. Okay? But then integrating that system, because I recall that we integrate that system here, that this system, which are first order the differential, partial differential equations, will, uh, will provide three more constants in terms of time. So the second system consist, will consist of a solution, u tilde, plus three constants, three functions of time. So finally, we have three constants here and three constants here. That, again, will have to be determined by six additional equations, conditions, that have to be given in advance, in advance if we want to determine the, the displacement equation, the, the, the displacement. Otherwise, it could be, if nothing is set, we have infinite solutions, because these constants can be any. Okay? In fact, six infinity, six times infinity of solutions, because these, consta these constants can be any. Okay. Looking a little bit about that. So, if I said, as I said, solving the first uh, system of equation in terms of rotations, we obtain a certain solution plus a certain constant. Let's group this constant in terms of theta as theta hat. And in terms of displacements, we obtain same solution plus some constants. Let's call them theta uh, u hat. And now, you know, whenever I have a displacement and a rotation, this defines what? A displacement and a rotation. Movement. Sorry? Movement. A movement. A rigid body movement. So, if I know the displacement, a displacement which is constant in a space, so constant displacement, like that. And then a rotation defined by a vector, by a vector which is in here somehow, is in here, a vector that moves that. That's what we call a rigid body motion. That and a rotation, superposition of that. Okay? So, in fact, in fact, this can be given by that. If I just define a displacement field was star, which is omega hat, what is omega hat? Well, the, the rotation tensor that is obtained placing the components of theta hat in the appropriate places, plus that displacement, okay? So if I take that, and I want to compute what are the strains corresponding to that, I see that the strains, which are the symmetric gradient, are one half of the gradient of that. Look, the gradient of that cancels that and provides omega, plus the transposed of omega. So the symmetric gradient of this, so this is the motion that corresponds to a rigid body motion that consists of a, 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 a translation, a, Displacement plus a rotation given by omega times x, which we already saw that the, this results into a rotation. And if we compute for this displacement field that depends on f of t, we compute the strains, we see that they are, e they are equal to omega plus omega transposed. By the way, omega is a rotation tensor, it's a skew symmetric tensor, and the skew symmetric tensor fulfills the property that the tensor by this transpose is zero. So, as it should be, the strains in this field, this spectrum field, constructed on the basis of this rotation and this uh, shifting, then has 
zero strains, which is logical because it's a rigid body motion. Okay? It's a rigid body motion. It's, it's, it, does it depend on X? Yes. But it's a strain. It's a strain, which is symmetric gradient, is zero. 